final presentation of Dr. Robert Watson's three-part lecture series, Heroes in History. The discussion today will be on his newly released book, Escape, the story of the Confederacy's Libby prison and the Civil War's largest jail break. And here's the book, it's a great read. My name is Rhonda Martin, and I'm delighted to introduce this program, which is being sponsored by the Friends of the Sterling Road Library. Just a reminder, Dr. Watson's lectures are being recorded and can be found on the Sterling Friends website, sterlingfriends.org. Tomorrow you can find it. Additionally, the website provides information about upcoming programs, as well as how you can support the friends of the library. Membership fees are as little as $10 per year, and the fees provide funding for all these wonderful programs. This program is about 25 minutes, and we'll have questions and answers following. Please keep yourselves muted. And today's program is gonna be in a slightly different format. Some of you may remember his, Dr. Watson's last series. He asked me to interview him about another book um, on George Washington. He asked me to interview him today about this book. So I'm going to be asking him questions and he'll give answers. We'll provide mostly his answers because he's so much fun to listen to and I hope you like this format. Okay, are you ready, Dr. Watson? I am. Great. Okay, um, we've learned a lot about historical and political events through your lecture series. I think the audience would like to know more about you personally and what inspires you. How did you become so interested in history and politics? Well, that, that, that's a good one. Um, so first off, thank you, Rhonda and Hannah, and, uh, Marilyn and Kay, and all the friends of the Sterling Road Library. Uh, I've become friends with the friends of the Sterling Road Library over the last uh, two years. Uh, this is what the third or fourth series I think I've done with all of you, and, and we'll try to set up another one for the spring. So it's always a pleasure. And uh, I'm a bibliophile, uh, which ties into your question, Rhonda, and also, um, who I am, I'm a bibliophile, I love books. Um, there's not a day in my adult life where I'm not reading or writing a book. Um, for this book here that I wrote, Escape, for example, uh, I read probably, oh my goodness, it's hard to say, 100 uh, Civil War era newspapers. I probably read uh, two dozen diaries of people who were involved in this. I probably read 50 government reports. I probably read 50 military reports. So I spend my days reading books and reading old um, um, uh, manuscripts and things of that effect. So I'm always reading, I'm always writing. So it's a pleasure to work with my local library. Um, so I, I guess a couple of things. Um, I've always been mm, an advocate for social justice. Uh, I'm always organizing I've organized and participated in Black Lives Matter rallies, Me Too rallies, March for Our Life rallies. Um, I organize events on campus. I organize events in the community. Uh, so I'm very interested in social justice and I'm also very interested in the history of it as well. Um, because the one thing about history is um, those who don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat the mistakes of history, right? And I always say that the stories uh, never change, just the names of the people involved. So uh, I've always had a great passion for that. Um, once I was in college, I found that I had a great and deep uh, uh, admiration for Harry Truman, uh, for Alexander Hamilton, for uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, for so Sojourner Truth, the former slave, for Eleanor Roosevelt, for Ben Franklin, I mean, I, I pretty much fell for all these people. These are my, these are my, my bros and my sisters. Um, so I've spent, um, you know, since my early 20s, I guess, reading these people. So I, I just love history. Um, history is also one of the disciplines, I think, where, for example, it, it sounds awfully nerdy, but when I was finishing my college degree, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I know what I didn't want to do, dentistry and chemistry. That was it, but I wanted to do everything else. 
And I literally made a list and I probably had 30 things on my list. I wanted to be a paleontologist. I wanted to be a social justice advocate. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a diplomat. I wanted to, I literally wanted to find a way to go to museums and get paid to tell people what to do. <laughs> I wanted to travel around the world and talk. I wanted to work on cruise ships. Uh, I wanted to be a wildlife biologist, a marine biologist. I wanted to be a lawyer for the NAACP. I wanted to be an advocate for, na for the National Organization for Women. I wanted to work for the Sierra Club and Greenpeace. I wanted to save the elephants. And I made this big list. And I sat down and I here's my quandary. Not that there were too many things on the list. But if I became a wildlife biologist, I couldn't be uh, an historian. If I became a, uh, an advocate for the, N a, a, a lobbyist for the NAACP, I couldn't be a paleontologist. If I became a journalist, I couldn't be. And then it dawned on me, if I become a professor, I could do everything. Uh, and if I become a professor and teach things like history and politics, I could do all the above. Um, I could, I, and I, I literally do all these things in some capacity with my job. So that makes it really exciting. But the common glue for everything besides social justice is history. History is the commonality on everything I do. And the icing on the cake, Rhonda, is that since I'm a professor, I can do all these rallies, run my mouth, go in the news and not get fired. <laughs> Any other job would have fired me years ago for all the things I do. So being a professor gives you both credibility and the license to, uh, to say what you want and not get fired. So um, all that factored in, I guess the other thing is I, my father used to take me to Gettysburg and Valley Forge when I was a little kid. So I kind of grew up running around Gettysburg. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania. There's a lot of history in Pennsylvania. I went to college in Virginia, a lot of great history in Virginia. I took my weekends when I was in college, I went to Virginia Tech. I went to Colonia Williamsburg, I went to Jamestown, I went to Yorktown, I went to Monticello, I went to Montpelier, which is James Madison's home, I went to Mount Vernon. In fact, I remember quite clearly um, missing a lot of classes and a lot of tests and a lot of things on Fridays and Mondays, because I spent a long weekend in places like Mount Vernon and Williamsburg and I didn't want to leave. And at the time, it seemed bad because I'd get a zero or I'd flunk a test and my professors would yell at me for missing it. But now looking back at it, and I'm glad I missed it because I spent, you know, I, I went to Yorktown. And by walking that battlefield, that was so much better than something I could have learned. And I don't even remember the professor's name. I don't even remember what class I missed, yet alone what was on the test I missed. So I've always loved history. And I think being in Pennsylvania, Virginia developed that passion. And history to me is the way that I can do everything. And history is the commonality for everything in, in our lives. So how do you not love history? How do you not want to be an historian? Well, we're glad that you picked this line of work. We're the benefactors of it. Huh. I'm getting in more into the book right now. Um, conditions in the Libby prison were intolerable. But the civilian residents of Richmond and the Confederate population also suffered, particularly during the latter part of the Civil War. You allude to extremely limited resources of manpower, money, and materials in the South, partly due to the Union blockade of Southern ports. Can you explain what the people of the Confederacy were experiencing during that time and how their circumstances impacted the Union prisoners? Yeah, so good. So I always say that the North, the Union, had three advantages in the Civil War. They had more men, more money, and more manufacturing or materials. The South ran out of everything, literally. Um, by early 1863, the Civil War was 1861 to 65. By halfway through, by early 1863, there was what I call a starvation atmosphere throughout the South. Literally, they ran out of, of everything. With all, I mean, because they didn't have enough men uh, to fight the war, every able-bodied man, literally from 12 to you could stand up, was in the war, which meant no one was there to work the fields. Um, fields went fallow. Uh, crops weren't being grown. Uh, slaves ran away, rightfully so. Um, so there was a starvation atmosphere. So if the Confederacy could not feed its soldiers, they sure as heck weren't going to feed its citizens. 
One thing about Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, he was a rotten human being in every sense of the word. Uh, the great Sam Houston, the big six foot six hero uh, of Texas. Sam Houston said that uh, the only difference, uh, he said Jefferson Davis is a lizard, a reptile. He said, but there is a difference. The lizard at least is a little bit warm. Um, Jefferson Davis was a horrible person. Um, he was, ironically, he and Confederates claimed that the Union was mistreating them and oppressing them, which they weren't. Jefferson Davis then functioned as a dictator and they oppressed their own people. Uh, they, 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 they cut out the free press. They limited a people's ability to vote. They, they limited transportation. Uh, if you disagreed with them, you were jailed. The Confederates ran, their, the South ran themselves like a, like a, a dictatorship. Uh, so if the army couldn't eat, Jefferson Davis sure as heck wasn't gonna feed civilians. So civilians were starving. People, civilians died in the droves of starvation. 620,000 men died in the Civil War in the North and South. But what we don't talk about is how many civilians died. Tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of Southern civilians died from starvation and lack of health care. So if the army's not going to eat, Davis and sure as heck wasn't going to feed the civilians. If they couldn't eat, they sure weren't going to feed Union soldiers and Union prisoners. So the starvation atmosphere was prevalent across the South because they ran out of food, they ran out of medicine, they ran out of clothing, they ran out of everything. Um, so the, 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 the prisoners were, were not fed. I calculated based on the, the several diaries that survived from uh, Civil War um, uh, prisoners, from Northern prisoners. I read their diaries and they described what they ate. There was after the war, the Union, um, the, the, the government uh, had commissions to study what happened in these Confederate prison camps. I read those carefully. I estimated that these prisoners were getting, they weren't getting enough of food and enough food daily to stay alive. That's if they ate. So if you were a prisoner, it wasn't if you were going to die. It was when you were going to die. They weren't getting enough food to live. By 63, there were days when they didn't get anything to eat. So there was a starvation atmosphere across the South, Army, Confederate Army, and citizens. And in the prisons, it was, it was even worse. You add to that, that there was no support for Union prisoners. A lot of the guards, a lot of the wardens in these Confederate prison camps treated Union soldiers abysmally. They tortured them. They purposely didn't feed them. They would walk through the prison and just kick people on the head. Soldiers that were just lying there and were too weak, you know, 90 pounds, too weak to even stand up. They just kick them in the head. They would walk through the prison and just arbitrarily just stab people just for kicks. So uh, the conditions were just uh, atrocious throughout the South and um, in the prison. And the last thing on that, Jefferson Davis um, and, and the Confederate government grotesquely mismanaged government. They couldn't make the trains run on time. They couldn't dispatch their army in the right locations. They, they, they were, it was like the Keystone cops were running the war for the South. So with that kind of grotesque mismanagement, the logistics of getting doctors or food or clothing or medicine to the Union soldiers didn't happen. Consequently, when Union soldiers were sent to Libby, this prison we're gonna talk about, after being beaten, one of the first things that happened is they were robbed and stripped. Um, one, ironically, one of the things that helped these soldiers to escape from the prison was half the population in Richmond was wearing blue Union uniforms because the clothing was better quality. So they would beat and strip all the Union prisoners. And if you're a baker in Richmond, if you're a blacksmith in Richmond, if you're a, a mother in Richmond, if you're a kid, they were all wearing Union clothing. So you couldn't tell who was union and who wasn't. So some of the guys, once they got out, just walked um, because everybody was wearing union uniforms. That's how destitute the South was. Yeah, you do talk quite a bit about how when the prisoners were captured, yeah, like you said, they were stripped of all their belongings and their clothes. And then if they had care packages sent to them, the Southerners took their packages from them. So they really got no relief while they were in prison. Okay, my next question is about actually about Libby Prison. In order to better understand the setting 
of the prison and the method of the escape, which we'll be talking about brief shortly, can you describe the location, construction, and the design of the Libby prison? Yeah, sure. So Libby was one of the most famous or infamous prisons of the entire war. For the Confederacy, it was easily the most important prison for the entire Confederacy. The reason, one of the reasons is its location. It was in Richmond, which was the capital of the Confederacy. Uh, uh, Montgomery in Alabama was the first capital of the Confederacy, but they moved it to Richmond. One, Alabama was too far south in the middle of nowhere. The fighting was in Virginia and Maryland, so they wanted the capital be, to be close to the fighting. Alabama had no major, uh, Montgomery, Alabama had no major roads, rail, river access. Richmond had the James River, which was one of the most important rivers in early American history. It meanders and snakes from Richmond uh, uh, southeast to around Williamsburg. It has access to the Chesapeake, which means it has access to the Atlantic. So the James River was important. Five, five railways intersected Richmond. So Richmond was the main transportation hub, uh, and many roads of the entire South. So it was the, they moved the capital there. So Libby was in the capital on Tobacco Row. If anybody knows Richmond, Tobacco Row is the celebrated area where, you know, a good deal of the tobacco, cotton, and agricultural produce of the South was shipped from there on the James River to the world. The other thing was Libby was reserved for only high-ranking Union officers. So if you're a famous general, they put you in Libby. So Libby was the most important prison for the Confederacy, and everybody in the Confederacy reported on it. Newspapers, I read newspapers from throughout the Confederacy. They all talked about this prison constantly because of its location in Richmond. The prison was near uh, the little the, the uh, Confederate White House where Jefferson Davis governed from. It was originally built from 1845 to 1852 by a guy named John Enders. Uh, Enders wanted it to be a tobacco warehouse. He built three large warehouses right on the edge of the canal and the river. Uh, they're three to four stories high, the big warehouses. Each one has six to eight rooms. The rooms are 105 feet by 45 feet. So they're, they're, they're big rooms, just open rooms for the warehouse. Now, in 1852, when Enders was finishing the warehouse, he was on the roof uh, doing the last details of it. The roof and his ladder collapsed he fell four stories to his death, just as he was finishing the warehouses. So the warehouses went to the husband of his oldest daughter, who died quickly and mysteriously. So the warehouses went to the oldest daughter, who died quickly and mysteriously. It went to another relative, who died quickly and mysteriously. They said that this, these buildings were haunted. They were cursed, which of course makes it the perfect place for one of the most wretched, horrific prisons in American history. It's said to be cursed and haunted. Uh, so no one wanted these warehouses. So what the Richmond folks do is they sell, they lease these warehouses to a northerner from Maine. His name was Luther Libby, and he had a son named George. They didn't know the place was cursed or haunted. And Luther Libby was a chandler. A chandler is like a warehouse person for ships. So Luther Libby used these three warehouses, not as tobacco factories or warehouses, but as uh, a place to supply all the ships that plied the James River. They sold sails and wood and tar and whatever you would need if you were a captain sailing a ship. So uh, that's where the name Libby Prison comes from. It was technically called Confederate Military Prison. How's that for the most generic name in the world? The prisoners called it Rat Hell because it was literally overrun with thousands and thousands of rats. When men would sleep, rats ran all over them, rats bit them. When they walked at night, they stepped on rats. It was just a floor of rats. So the men called it rat hell. They called it the Bastille of the Confederacy. It was said to be escape proof. Of course, any time a prison is said to be escape proof, there's gonna be an escape and it makes it even better, right? Uh, it was also called the Castle of Despair. So it had all these haunted, you know, wretched, alarming names. Um, but what everybody nicknamed it was Libby, because when they, when the Confederacy turned it into a prison, they didn't take the sign down that said Libby and Sons uh, from Luther and George Libby. So they, it was called Libby. So the last thing on that is um, 
no one, the North or South, no one thought the war was going to last long. The North said, we have more men, money, and manufacturing. This thing will be over in, in one to three months. The South said, our soldiers are honorary and violent. They like to fight, and we have better generals, which the South did. So the war will end in one to three months. Even Lincoln only provided enlistments for 30 to 90 days. So if everybody thought the war was going to end quickly, which it didn't, nobody planned for prisoners. What happened was as soon as the Civil War started, both the North and South found themselves with thousands and thousands of prisoners, and no one knew what to do. So the South said, we're going to convert these giant warehouses and just make them warehousing humans. They just piled prisoners in. Now, because a guy from Maine, Luther Libby, had it, they just took it from him. And there was no beds, no, no, no nothing. It was just empty big rooms in the warehouse. So they took all the cotton and all the, all the tobacco and all the sails and wood and nails and whatever they were going to sell to the ships. And they just had all these giant empty rooms and they just filled them with Union prisoners. So the men slept on the floor. Um, they slept at open windows. And in the winter, if it snowed or rained or was cold, that cold air would come in and in the morning, they would find someone who was covered in water from the rain or snow and the person would be frozen stiff and dead. Um, so yeah, it was a hellacious condition. So Libby started as a tobacco and a warehouse and it turned into a chandlery and it ended up being a warehouse for humans, a prison. Okay, thanks for that. Um, now to get to the crux of your book, what was the eventual escape plan and how was the escape actually accomplished? So the main protagonist in my book, his name is Colonel Thomas E. Rose, Rose like the flower. He's a Pennsylvanian. I grew up not far from me in Eastern Pennsylvania. He grew up in Quaker country outside of Philly, which meant the Quakers were abolitionists. So Rose was against slavery. Um, Rose came from a family of school teachers. Um, so, um, and he wanted to sort of set out on his own and make a name for himself. So he moved to Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh was the wild, wild west back then. He became a school principal. Now Rose was the guy behind escape. What's so fun about Rose is he's almost a walking contradiction. He's a quiet, mild mannered school principal, but he's a big guy who's extremely powerful, big burly beard, and he is brave and courageous in battle. He's one of the first to join the war effort because he's an abolitionist. He's upset with the South. Rose rises up from the bottom all the way to a colonel like that. Why? His men love him. Rose treats everybody with dignity. Rose would never ask anyone to do something he wouldn't do. Rose was an officer who led from the front. He's ultimately captured at the Battle of Chickamauga in the South. The Confederates are busting a hole in the Union line. What Rose does, unlike most officers, he races to the line with a few men. He's trying to plug the line himself in hand-to-hand -hand combat, sword drawn. Uh, Rose gets captured. He's taken by train to Richmond. They use Libby as a warehouse for all prisoners. Then they would take enlisted men and send them all around the South, but they would leave the highest ranking officers in Libby. Rose is a colonel. He's a great hero, so he's definitely going to Libby. They're on an open train car. It's at night, it's raining. So Rose sees his chance. He jumps off the train to run. He lands wrong and breaks his foot and ankle. He runs on a broken foot and ankle, manages to elude the Confederate soldiers who are chasing him for hours and hours and hours. When they catch him, they beat him violently with the butts of their guns. They take Rose to uh, Richmond. Now. There was this cruel process, which I think speaks a lot about a lot of uh, the residents and the people that lived there. When they, they would pull up at the train depot, you had to walk through the center of town to Libby Prison. The local residents would line up on either side of the road as a gauntlet, and they would parade the prisoners through the road. The locals would throw feces and garbage on them, spit on them, run up and sucker punch them. And the prisoners were humiliated as they walked through this gauntlet of screaming, violent Southerners. A lot of the prisoners said that what scared them the most was um, even old women 
would run up and scream, kill them all now. And they're saying, my gosh, even if that's women, little children would run up and kick them and throw things at them and with a stick start hitting them. Plus, they all knew where they were going. Richmond, Libby. Libby was like the boogeyman. Soldiers at night would be sitting around a camp going, oh, I hope I don't get caught and go to Libby. So Libby was this notorious, wretched, infamous prison. So the prisoners are marching through this gauntlet, having stuff thrown on them, sucker punched, people screaming, kill them now. The Confederate guards would laugh and say, maybe we'll just kill them now, arbitrarily stab someone. The men thought Rose had lost his mind because Rose is walking in front of them face forward. People are sucker punching and throwing stuff. He didn't even clean the spit off his eyes. They think he's like a walking corpse. He's lost his mind. Why was Rose not doing or saying anything? He was memorizing all the streets. He was memorizing how he was counting how many steps because he knew he was going to leave at night. He was looking at where there would be a soldier, an outpost, where there was a lantern hanging. So Rose is like an, a robot as he goes into Libby. They beat him because he's the famous Colonel Rose who tried to escape. They strip him, they rob him. He doesn't say a word as he's being beaten. Why? He's memorizing the prison. So he's gonna escape from the beginning. What happens is by December of 1863, by January of 1864, a few things. Number one, it's the coldest winter uh, on record. So you have open windows, the men, some are naked, some are with just, you know, long johns. They, they don't have jackets, they don't have blankets, they don't have beds. They're freezing to death. I told you at the outset that there's a starvation atmosphere. So food is coming in Monday, Thursday, infrequently. So the men are not eating. There's no more health care, no more medicine. They're being beaten arbitrarily. The South is losing the war, so they're taking it out on the prisoners. The freezing cold weather. So Rose decides, I'm going to die within days. We're all going to. There's only one thing to do. I have to escape. So in the middle of one stormy night, lightning, thunderclaps, rain, Rose sneaks to a window. Why? Because there, the roof was leaking. So the Confederates put up scaffolding on the side of the building to fix the roof. The storm kicked in. They all ran and left the scaffolding up. The guards were hiding inside because the storm was so bad. So Rose figures, if I can get out the window, now they have bars on the window, but Rose is, is like the rock. He's a, he's a beast of a man. If I can tear these things apart and jump out on the scaffolding, I could climb down and get out of here. So in the pitch black, he's feeling along the wall. He's trying to pry it open. A lightning bolt hits and it lights up the area. Um, all of a sudden what happens is there's a face right next to his. Scares the hell out of him. It turns out it's, it's, a, it's a major named Andrew Hamilton, who's from Kentucky. And Hamilton and Rose both gasped because they couldn't even see each other. That's how black the night was. Hamilton's trying to escape just like Rose. So they shake hands, they whisper, and then they realize they can't get out of the bars. They go back to bed. A few nights later, uh, uh, two nights later, Rose gets sneaks down into the basement. There's a dungeon under this prison. The problem is the dungeon is where a sewage system goes through it. So it's filled with feces and urine. It's so foul. No one can handle it. But that means it's so foul the Confederate guards don't go there. Rose is a big guy. He busts the door open and goes into the basement. He's feeling, he's walking through feces and urine, stepping on rats, feeling his way along the wall to find the sewage. He realizes when he looks out the window, he sees that the sewage runs into the James River. He sees rats running in and out. If, that means if he can get into the sewer, he can swim through raw sewage get into the James River and escape. He's feeling along the wall. He bumps into another human. They both gasp. It's Hamilton again. What's the likelihood? So Hamilton and Rose decide we're going to escape together. So Rose is the big tough guy that comes up with the plan. They're going to dig a tunnel into the sewer out of the prison. Hamilton is like MacGyver. Do you all remember MacGyver? Hamilton can fix anything, solve anything. He's super, he comes up with all these cool inventions. Uh, for example, he ties a rope around Rose's ankle from a clothesline they stole. Rose goes so deep underground that no air can get in and if Rose suffocates and passes out, Hamilton can pull him out by the rope. Hamilton also steals a spittoon and designs a pulley system. 
as Rose digs rock and dirt out, he doesn't have to climb out of the tunnel to empty it. He can put it in the spittoon, yank on the rope. Hamilton pulls it out, hides the dirt and rocks, pulls it back in. Hamilton steals a hat, puts a wood like a frame inside the big brim of the hat. He fans air into the tunnel to keep the candle lit and to keep Rose breathing. So Hamilton and Rose make a great team. And those guys spend 37, 38, something like that days deep underground, digging all night long. Now, the problem with digging all night long, they can't sleep. So they're starving, they're freezing, and now they're not sleeping. They know they're going to die soon. So it's a race against time. And every morning before the roll call, they have to sneak back upstairs for the roll call. And then every night when everybody goes to bed, they have to sneak back downstairs. So um, uh, the problem was the Confederate guards found the door broken, so they double bolt it. Hamilton finds behind these big black cauldrons where they boil soup for the prisoners, uh, like a witch's cauldron. There's a, 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 a fireplace. No one uses the fireplace. So Hamilton steals a little pocket knife and he chisels away at all the mortar. Every night they have to take it apart, brick by brick, mortar by mortar. And in the morning, put it back and put the mortar in to make it look like no one was there. And then Rose has to man up and push these giant cauldrons away. And they have to sneak down under the fireplace drop down into the sewer in the dungeon and then dig from there. So it's a harrowing uh, ordeal to dig out of the prison, but they do it. Okay. Um, yeah, actually in your book, you say eventually they get other people to help them dig out. So I guess, you know, they were getting very desperate. Um, yeah, in your book, you talk about 109 prisoners actually were able to escape through this tunnel, of which 48 were recaptured. Um, what happened to those soldiers that were able to successfully escape? Okay. And also those that were re-imprisoned. So everybody's starving. Uh, the wardens are arbitrarily torturing people. They have a game they call the Libby Lottery they'll get, let's say, a dozen colonels. And they'll say, each of you pull a straw. Whomever gets the short straw gets to die. So it was like a torture, psychological warfare. Just And the Southerners just did it for kicks. Um, they dug a trench around the prison and, and mined it with explosives, threatening to blow the prison up just for kicks. So Rose and Hamilton are dying. Uh, they're digging like crazy. They dug three tunnels. One ran into the sewage and it overflowed. Rose almost drowned in raw sewage. I mean, disgusting. Another one ran into a, a, a big a bottom of an oak tree and, and you can't dig through oak with a little chisel that you stole. Um, so on the fourth tunnel, they realized they're gonna die. So they need more help. They need people digging around the clock. So they, they, they recruited 13 guys. So they digged in three five man shifts around the clock to get out of it. Ultimately, on February 9th, 1864, on a dark and bitterly cold night, they broke ground. Rose, all the dirt went in his eyes. He could feel the cold air come in. But when they broke ground, there was a shoe right beside them. There was a Confederate guard right there. They almost dug right up onto a guard. Um, once uh, once they, they escaped, they had 109 men escape. Um, but as you said, Rhonda, what makes the story interesting, some lived, some died. Some escaped, some were recaptured. And I read the diaries of, of these men. They read like a movie. Uh, in, one of the first to make it out all the way, they went to Williamsburg. Uh, the James River snakes all the way to Williamsburg so they could follow the river. They would run by night, hide by day. Now they knew certain directions because there was a famous spy in Richmond. No one knew who the spy was. The South was on a massive manhunt for the spy. The North, the spy was legendary. This spy snuck information into the prison. So the men knew where to go. The spy snuck food. The spy used lemon juice. When you put milk on it and heat it up, it will appear on paper. So if you look at the paper, there was nothing. The men knew what to do with it. Um, the spy had a codex. So they would do things encrypted in code, just like you know the Enigma machine or something. So the spy helped the men to escape. They, 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 they got to go all the way to Williamsburg. Now, the problem for Rose 
he runs for over a week on a broken foot and ankle. No food. Uh, Rose almost gets caught. He dives underwater, holds his breath. He hides in a tree stump. He fights soldiers. It, it, it's crazy. One of the first to make it to Williamsburg is Hamilton, the young, dashing uh, major I told you about, who's like MacGyver from Kentucky, a very handsome young guy. Hamilton can run. He's in great shape. He's one of the first to make it there. He warns the Union soldiers in Williamsburg. The North took over Williamsburg, and the spy told him that. So Hamilton's one of the first to get there. They have another famous guy named Abel Strait. He's a big, burly Dutchman. Uh, really big guy. And uh, Strait was a raider. He would conduct these raids in the South. So the South hated him more than anyone. So Strait is beaten constantly. They put Strait in solitary confinement in the dungeon constantly. Strait's also so big when he's sneaking through the tunnel, he gets stuck like Winnie the Pooh. They have to strip him down. There's a man in front pulling and one behind pushing his butt. They finally squeeze Strait through. He's so weak, so run down, he can't go anywhere. But this famous spy has a former slave meet him and sneak them to the spy's house where they hide him for over a week. Once the Confederates stop looking, they load him up on the wagon, cover him with food and ride him to Williamsburg. So Colonel Abel Strait, this big famous guy, the Dutchman, he lives through it. There was um, two other men that were, they called, Rose called his silent partners. They couldn't escape. One was Frederick Bartleson. He couldn't escape because he only had one arm and he was so weak. Bartleson was one of the first men to sign up for the bat war in Illinois. He was a colonel, but he led from the front. He gets his arm blown off. He refuses to, to resign his military commission. He keeps, he stays in uniform with one arm. He gets captured, but with one arm, he can't crawl through the tunnels, climb down into the dungeon. So what he does is he writes poetry. And Bartleson is such a wonderful poet that he reads poetry for all the men to, to keep them, to keep their willpower up as they're dying. And, and when a man dies, he writes a poem for him. For, for men who, who were illiterate or, or missed their mothers or their wives or their girlfriends or their daughters, he wrote poems and then they would try to send them out of the prison to them. The other silent partner was Federico Cavada. He was a dashing Cuban. He looked like a, um, like a cavalier from the, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, with the goatee and the pointy thing in his hair. He's a dashing Cuban who spoke many languages. He was an engineer. He was, um, he was a really neat guy. He, um, he, he was one of these, he came up with these uh, hot air balloons. He would float in a hot air balloon above the battlefield and he could see where the Confederate soldiers were. You know, we didn't have any radar or anything. He would use some of four flags to tell the Union soldiers on the ground where the Confederates were. He would sketch the battlefield, come down in his balloon and give it to the officers. He was at Gettysburg. When his balloon landed, the Confederate soldiers saw it and they ran out and they beat him and captured him. The problem for Cavada was the Confederate, because he was Cuban and he had an accent, an immigrant, they beat him and made fun of him. Some things never change. Uh, so they made fun of him um, and he was so weak he couldn't escape. But Cavada was a writer too. And he wrote this beautiful and detailed daily account of it after the war. And I had that to help me. So anyway, Cavada would stand by the window and be on the lookout for Rose. Rose um, takes him over a week as all these men are running. Tragically, unbelievably, after all this, Rose gets captured. He's, he's hiding outside of Williamsburg. He's looking across the, an empty field. He can see the smoke from the Union campfires. He can smell the bacon and things cooking. He can hear the Union soldiers, but he's looking across this empty field. He says, if I go out in the field and the Confederates are around, they'll catch me because I'm limping on a broken foot and ankle. And what if they have horses? So he starts, well, he sits for hours. He starts sneaking through the field. As he's sneaking through the field, five Confederate soldiers stand up around him in tall grass. They were there as early centuries and the, the Union tried to leave Williamsburg. Rose gets, Rose beats the hell out of some of them. This is how big and tough he was. But one of them with the butt of his gun pops Rose in the head and knocks him out. They beat him savagely and take him back to Libby. The fate for the men that were recaptured, Rhonda, they were all beaten and beaten and beaten, then tortured and tortured and tortured, then thrown in solitary. Some didn't make it. Some died from all that. Somehow, against all odds, because he was the ringleader, Rose lives through this to give you a sense of his willpower and strength. 
He lives through it, I'm happy to tell you. Rose um, lives through the war. He becomes a general. He spends his life in uniform and lives a long, good life. Late in life, people ask him to write his story of Libby, this dashing escape. Rose is so humble, he can't brag. He writes this short story that pretty much doesn't say anything. Here's the good news. All the other men, Abel, Straight, this big guy, um, Cavada, Hamilton, uh, they were all so upset at Rose for under, you know, discounting everything that it prompted all of them to write their accounts of the two, which I found all these accounts. Um, so Hamilton makes it out. Rose gets uh, captured, beaten and beaten and beaten. He somehow lives through it. They know Cavada's part of it, even though he didn't escape. So he's beaten again. Um, Bartleson, they know he's writing poems in part. He's beaten again. Bartleson manages to live through this typical him. He goes back into the war and is leading from the front in the final days of the war. The one armed colonel is shot and killed. But the men saved his poetry, which I reprint in the book. I start every chapter with some of his poetry and I reprint at the end of it some of his. Fortunately, Bartleson's lovely poetry survived. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite an ordeal for those that didn't make it. Uh, and some then were beaten and, and tortured so savagely they died after failing to escape. Okay. Uh, my next question was actually going to be about the, the spy who lived in Richmond. Um, I assume you're talking about Elizabeth Van Loo? That's who, her. <laughs> a lady, a lady spy who helped the Union prisoners escape. Um, and I was reading also, you allude to that she was actually uh, regarded as a hero by the North after the war. I, I didn't mention her sex because I wanted to wait and let you or me drop that on everybody later. It turns out that the this top spy was a, a, an old woman who didn't get married, Elizabeth Van Loo. I love Elizabeth Van Loo. She's one of my heroes from history. They called her Crazy Bet. She was from Philly. She was an abolitionist. Uh, so she bought a lot of slaves and freed them all. Now, where could they go? They'd be beaten, raped, returned to slavery. So she let them live in her mansion. She had the biggest mansion in all of Richmond. Anybody knows Richmond? Up on Church Hill, overlooking the James River. So she had all these slaves, former slaves, living there freely. What Elizabeth Van Loo did was she played like she was crazy. They called her Crazy Bet. Because if it's a crazy old woman, no one suspects her. She would make these pots of delicious food. She would take them to the prison. The guards and wardens were starving, so they would smell this good food. She would say, I brought you all pots of food, but here's the deal. You got to let me give the other pots to the prisoners. They let, them, they let her do it because they were so hungry. She would get big baskets of eggs, one for the guards and wardens, one for the prisoners. And they, 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 all, they always did the deal because they were starving. The ones for the prisoners, at the bottom, she carve them out and stick letters in with directions on how to escape. She would put letters which she wrote in her lemon juice. She communicated with Benjamin Butler and Ulysses Grant, the top Union generals. So Crazy Bet was a hero. Um, the big Abel Strait, the Dutchman, um, when he got out, he couldn't run away. So Crazy Bet, Elizabeth Van Loo hit him in her mansion. She, uh, so she helped everyone. She was so brave. Uh, there was a bounty on her head that didn't stop her. When the war ends, uh, a, a mob surrounds her house. They want to burn her house down and kill her. She storms out on her front porch and tells them, if you touch me, Ulysses Grant is on his way and is hell to pay. <laughs> the mob backed down. Grant sent and Benjamin Butler sent one of their toughest spies as a personal bodyguard to protect Elizabeth Van Lu. Um, she lost everything, of course, because the Southerners weren't too happy with her after the war. So when Grant becomes president, he hires her as the postmaster. So she has a job and an income. Uh, Elizabeth Van Loo was a great hero. Um, she, um, she helped soldiers to escape. Um, one of the descendants from Paul Revere, um, she helped to escape. And later the man went to find her and gave her money. There was a dashing uh, Dutch Union officer named Ulrich Dahlgren, who only had one leg. And he gets captured by the South. They torture him and drag him through the streets as a carnival freak show because he had one leg. They hang him and his leg up at night 
so people can spit on it and torture it. He's, you know, this corpse. The next morning they get up and it's gone. Elizabeth Van Loo snuck out that night and cut it down and hid his body. After the war, she told the family and they were able to recover Ulrich Dahlgren's body. Elizabeth Van Loo was remarkable. What a contribution from a wonderful woman uh, during the war. I'm happy to tell you she lived to around the year 1900. So she lived a long life. She was ostracized in the South, public enemy number one, but the North considered her rightly a heroine. And those men that escaped, they all thanked Elizabeth Van Loo. A lot of them sent money to her afterward to help her out. They all credit her for their escape. That's an incredible story. Um, after the war, what happened? I guess the soldiers were freed from Libby prison, the, the prisoners by the Union Army. What happened to the soldiers that I imagine they needed a lot of medical care? And um, did, did they all make it, survive? Yeah, the lots died. I mean, a lot died. There was a, um, there was a, uh, uh, they called it the boneyard. The, the, another one they called the dead house. They just piled up bodies. Um, I mean, men were dying left and right every day, every night people were dying. Um, and a lot of them were just buried under the ground. So under the ground there, there are just, it's littered with bones. Um, uh, some were taken to Shockgo uh, Cemetery in Richmond, if anybody knows that. Um, so the war ends in April of 65. Uh, Grant surrounds Petersburg and Richmond, lays siege to it and takes Richmond. The Confederates, Jefferson Davis and Lee, if they can't have Richmond, no one can. They burn their own city to the ground. I mean, just, you know, that's for another lecture. Lincoln arrives in early April and uh, the Union Army comes in and they free the remaining men. A lot died, so some remain. Now, we have multiple accounts of Confederates when they were captured by the Union. A lot of them were happy because they ate. They got a blanket. They got bedding. They got health care. Now, some Union prisons were bad, to be sure. Elmira in New York, people died wholesale, but not from neglect and torture, from disease. So the Southern prisons were different. Southerners tortured and just went absolutely bonkers, you know, with just their, their inhumanity and violence. The North treated Southern prisoners largely with dignity. That's a fact. Um, so Lincoln goes to Richmond. He wants to meet with Davis, Lee, but they all had run. So Lincoln tours Richmond in early April of 65, and there's two things he wants to see. He wants to go to the Confederate White House. Lincoln, as you know, is extremely tall, 6'4". He goes and he says, I want to sit in Jeff Davis's seat at his desk. Of course, Lincoln couldn't resist. He says, boy, this desk is a little small. Wait, it's way too small for a man like me. And he's just screwing with Jeff Davis about that. The second thing he wants to do in Richmond is he wants to go where? To Libby. Lincoln visits Libby. Crowds gather because everybody knows about this. To me, it's shocking that history has utterly forgotten this place. And yet at the time, it was notorious. It was legendary. Lincoln goes to Libby and crowds scream, tear it down, because they know about, you know, it was, I call it a charnel house. I mean, just meat and bones, right? Lincoln says, no, save it as a monument. We need to know what happened here. We need to remember what happened here, a lesson in inhumanity and depravity. Um, so um, after the war, one of the interesting things is some of the brutal Confederate guards, there was a, a war, an assistant warden named Dick Turner. The head warden was Thomas Turner. No relation, same last name by coincidence. The Thomas Warner was a little guy with a chip on his shoulder who was just evil. Dick Turner was a real big guy with a, a beard who just arbitrarily beat everyone. When the Union captured Libby, they captured Dick Turner. They decided to put him in prison, guess where? In Libby. So poetic justice, uh, although they didn't beat and torture him the way he did. So um, yeah, those men needed immediate care. I'm sad to say, Rhonda, some of the men after being liberated died because they were so sick and weak. The same way we see a lot of Holocaust Prisoners, when the camps were liberate, they died just from days and months and years of depravity. And, you know, you can't recover from that kind of malnutrition. Some of these Union soldiers were down to, you know, 90 pounds. Um, and um, but those that did live, I can't even imagine the feelings. Two quick things I need to say. The two most shocking things I think about my book 
Libby was used for propaganda and as a zoo. The prisoners called it the Libby Zoo. I don't know what this says about Southerners, but what they did was they, they would tour Libby the way you or I would go to a zoo. And they mocked the men. It was, it was for kicks. So they would give tours of Libby and they'd say, oh, you remember the famous Union general, whatever, whatever, from whatever battle. And they would say, there he is, half naked, on his side, down to 90 pounds, in feces, unable to stand up. Ah, ha, ha. And the next exhibit in the zoo. So they treated it like a human zoo. Can you imagine the humiliation? They also used it for propaganda. Even though the South, even though they were, the Southerners were brutal, they didn't try to disguise or hide what they were doing in Libby. On the contrary, they wanted people to hear it. Because Union soldiers, if they heard about it, the South said it will deter them from fighting against us. No one would enlist in the army because they knew if you enlisted, if you were caught, Rhonda, you were going to Libby and there's only one way out of Libby, horizontal in a box. Short, long story short, it had an opposite effect. When the Union soldiers heard about this, they wanted to fight. It was almost like uh, two decades earlier, remember the Alamo, you know? It was remember Libby. Uh, so the Lincoln and the Union soldiers, when they liberated it, it would be the feeling of these soldiers. And I don't mean, and I don't mean this lightly. I, I've written on the Holocaust, I mean it with all due respect. But similar to the feelings those soldiers must have had when liberating the camps, they threw up and were sick at the smell and what they saw and the bodies and bones. But the feeling of saving thousands of people who had been systematically abused for years must have been just an, an un indescribable feeling. So yeah, same with Libby. Yeah, some of what you're talking about reminds me of um, the your ship, the book you wrote about the the ship in Brooklyn. Um, Ghost ship of Brooklyn. Yep. Ghost ship of Brooklyn. How the uh, Americans were treated by the British. Same um, ship, Yeah. Yeah, we're getting kind of close um, to questions and answers. Um, so, let's skip over some things. Um, wanted to ask if you're writing another book and can you tell us about any of your future projects? Am I writing another book, Rhonda? <laughs> okay, I know the answer, but if you can elaborate, oh boy. I got, I got two cooking. Uh, I'm, I'm done with one. I just have to clean it up and shorten it. The other one I just finished researching. I'm, I'm putting uh, uh, you know, pen to paper now. Um, one's called When Washington Burns. It's about the British burning Washington, D.C. on August 24th, 1814. It tells the story of their march to the city, the Americans trying to defend it, the actual day-to-day -day details of burning the city. And it tells the story of a handful of young government clerks who risked their lives to save the Declaration, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, George Washington's letters, these young men at the 11th hour scrambling to save us. Also Dolly Madison, the yeah. wife of the president, waited to the last minute to save the artifacts from what is the building known as the White House. So it's a story of not only conflagration, the burning of our capital city, but a story of loss, but a story of great heroism by those who saved it. Uh, and the other one I'm writing is called 100 Days of Terror. Um, I was inspired by the pandemic it's about the first horrible pandemic to hit America. That was in 1793 and it hit the capital city. And guess what? People were told to socially distance. They were told to wear masks. Please don't get mad at the friends and don't get mad at me, I'm being factual. Conservatives and preachers said it's a fake. It's a hoax, it doesn't exist. They were gonna pray it away. A lot of conservatives refused to wear a mask and went about in public. Consequently, they all died. Um, it, it was panic and fear. People blamed one another. Uh, there was civil society collapsed. Uh, it, some brave doctors stayed behind and died. So it's a story that has a lot of eerie parallels to today, but it's about the first pandemic. I'm writing that one uh, now. And the third book I'm still researching. Okay, was that about smallpox that you were in 1793? Was it was yellow fever. Yellow, oh, yellow fever, fever was the first okay. pandemic, and there was no known cause or cure. Um,
Today we know it comes from Aedes aegypti, uh, a mosquito from the tropics in Africa. Talk about poetic justice. Those mosquitoes came in on slave ships. So by bringing the slave ships in, they brought the mosquitoes in. Some people during that first pandemic put one and one together and figured it was tropical in nature. So what did they do? They discriminated even further against blacks and they blamed slaves and blacks for, you know, so some things never change. So that book is chock full of uh, difficult lessons, but also heroism in some of these doctors. And a lot of, you know, when people were fleeing the cities, uh, blacks couldn't afford, and slaves couldn't afford to flee. So a lot of them stayed behind. They were the heroes who buried and cared for the people and kept the cities going. But that doesn't make the textbooks for obvious reasons. So, um, so I can't wait to tell that story. Oh, we look forward to that. I hope I can interview you on one of those books too. Yes, and yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we're ready for questions and answers. And Hannah and Marilyn are going to go ahead and look at the chat. And um, just want to thank you again for a wonderful presentation. And we'll see you Pleasure. in the spring. Got it. Thank you, Rhonda, and thank you, Dr. Watson. Um, one of the questions uh, is, where did you find all of those diaries and how many, about how many did you read? Good. So um, I do research seven days a week, 365 days a year. I'm never not doing research. Um, my sweet spot, my specialty, I guess you could say is finding the history that other historians have missed. It's fun. It just requires an enormous amount of work. Um, so I dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. I'm always, I was in New York City the other day. I was in Richmond. I was in, I always go places. I'm always reading. Um, and then when I find something good, I, I usually try to pursue five projects at a time because invariably one won't work out, two won't work out, or there's just nothing else. But if I find enough stuff, I'll do it. So um, I'm, I'm not good at very much, Hannah. Uh, if, if you need your oil changed in your car, I'm not your guy. Um, if you have a problem with your plumbing, I have no idea how to fix it. I'm not very handy. But if you need me to find a 200-year-old letter, oh, man, I am so your guy, right? <laughs> so um, I found a dozen diaries of men that survived. I found another eight sets of letters. I found the uh, papers from the warden of the prison. I found the Elizabeth Van Loo's correspondence back and forth with the generals. I found the reports from the union that studied the prison. Richmond had four daily, new, four newspapers. Some were daily, some were weekly. They all wrote about Libby constantly because they were so proud of it. They were proud that they were mass murdering people. Um, in fact, they would even vote saying, you know, 20 died this week. At this rate, we can kill all the Northerners. Um, so I read, you know, probably a hundred uh, you know, newspapers. Um, so yeah, um, so I dug and dug and dug. One of the things that helps is when you find one diary, that soldier wrote the names of some of the other people that lived. So now I had names. So once I have a name, it helps me to find the next diary. That one has more names, it helps me to find the next diary. Um, and of course, the, the military reports, a lot of that stuff is in the Library of Congress. Um, and so it still survives. Fortunately, a lot of it's been digitized. A lot of it nobody's ever read, uh, just because, you know, who would go read it? But um, some, a lot of it's been digitized. Some of it, I literally have to go sit in the basement and, and sneeze a lot because of all the dust. But thank God for librarians and archivists. Um, and, and, and it's amazing how this stuff was saved. Absolutely amazing. And again, Bartleson, that colonel with one arm, his poetry survives. Uh, Samuel, uh, could you unmute and ask your question? Samuel Will Stockhammer. Oh, hi, Sam. Sam's a buddy of mine. Sam right. read the early draft of this when it was in rough, 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 misspelled um, form. Yeah, Sam read an early draft and gave me feedback. Thanks, Sam. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to do that. And uh, your presentation was fantastic. Uh, refresh some of the things I've forgotten about the book. Uh, I urge all of you to get the book. It's a gripping story, uh, fascinating to read. And uh, thank you, Dr. Watson.
Thank you, Sam. And um, I'll have those other two books. I'll have one of them to you around January and the other one sometime in 2022. Uh, I'm hoping uh, spring of 2022 for the other one for you to read. So, uh, yep. Look forward to it. Yep. Dr. Dr. Watson, once again, you managed to find a part of history that most of us are not familiar with and just make it into the most interesting, fascinating part of history. And we just all go crazy that we didn't know about it before. And we're so appreciative of um, your sharing so much with us. Rhonda, I'm so proud of you. You did an incredible job interviewing tonight. And um, you're, you're a star for sure. So it's, um, I, Rob, uh, Dr. Watson, you had mentioned you wanted to share a few pictures. And we've yeah, gone yeah, over the sure, time, sure. but. For some reason, it's not coming up. Um, okay. I don't know why. Um, yeah, see, it's not. I put pictures together of Rose and everybody. And I don't know why it's not coming up. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, while, you're, while you're trying to do that, we have one last question that we're going to yeah. take from Marsha Lefkowitz. Right. As you know, the commander of Andersonville was put on trial after the war. Why wasn't the warden of Libby prison put on trial? Good. So uh, Captain Henry Wirtz was the, he was Swiss. He was the captain of Andersonville. Andersonville was the, in Georgia. That was the bloodiest of all prisons. Um, uh, 13,000 men died in there in one year um, to give you a sense of how brutal it was. Um, that captain was, was tried and, and put to death hanging after the war. Um, the uh, Libby, the, the, the warden wasn't put to death because he ran away and got away. Um, he, uh, Thomas Turner ran to Texas. Uh, other Confederates were helping him escape. He went to Mexico. He hated Mexico. He went to England, hated England went to Canada, hated Canada. He swore he'd never live in the US under the Union because they were so oppressive. He finally realized it was the best place to live and went back. He hid in Tennessee. We didn't find out that he had been there until after he died. Um, the deputy warden was put in prison. The main reason why they all weren't tried was because of Lincoln. Lincoln's uh, magnanimity and humility. Lincoln wanted forgiveness. Uh, Lincoln did not want uh, he wanted to heal the union and bring it back together. And even though the South did all that, he gave express orders. He did not want to see everybody hunted down and killed and tortured and tried. Best way to heal this country is just bring it back together as one and whole. Lincoln said, we need to care for the widow and the, and, and the child uh, without a father and, and make sure that, you know, they're our priority after the war. So, yeah, so uh, that cruel Thomas Turner, that cruel SOB escaped justice. Okay, well, can we end on a pleasant note? <laughs> is, there anything, is there anything that you can, yeah, any so optimistic? I would say this, you know, bad and good. The lessons are quite clear, everybody, that in every war, uh, prisoners are treated horribly. Humanity does its worst uh, in every war, every culture, every country, every period in history. This is not new. What happened in Libya is not new. We just forgot about it here. So history is replete with us treating brothers and treating enemies, alleged enemies, and everybody in the worst way. And that's a sad indictment of humanity. But the good side is history is also replete with just inhuman, extraordinary acts of courage and valor and bravery. Some of those prisoners helped their comrades to escape. Elizabeth Van Lu risked her life daily to help them escape. Former slaves helped those white men to escape. Um, Rose helped his comrades to escape, and yet he's being beaten daily, starved, and is doing it on a broken. So uh, what we find is there are these amazing acts of heroism and bravery, which give us hope uh, of what people can do. I don't know how Rose survived this, quite frankly. Um, and this ended up being the largest prison break in American history. The movie Great Escape, uh, which was about the true escape in World War II from Stulag Luft, uh, the Nazis. 70 some men escaped there. This is 109. And all but three of those that escaped the Nazis were recaptured and killed by the Nazis. So this is the largest and most successful prison break. Um, so it, it, it's a compelling narrative. Uh, and I think it's, after reading it, I found myself wanting those Confederate guards and wardens to be tortured. 
And I was upset at myself for wanting that because they were so brutal. I came away from it with even more respect for the likes of Lincoln who said, no, let them go back to the farms. Given what they had done, uh, just, oh, I, one last thing I'll end with, with inhumanity, Hamilton. Hamilton lives through it, goes back to Kentucky. Of course, he's hated in Kentucky because he was fought for the Union and helped everyone to escape. He's sitting out on a Saturday night, a nice, comfortable Saturday night, sitting outside of a, a pub with another veteran, enjoying a drink and a chat. A bunch of young rascals show up and they're like, you're Hamilton. They pull out a pistol and kill him, this man who escaped. So he gets back to Kentucky and his fellow, I, maybe it was Mitch McConnell's great, 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 great grandfather, but somebody <laughs> shot his butt. Um, so just, I mean, these stories are just unimaginable, uh, but happily Rose lived a long life. Cavada, the Cuban, he becomes a general in the Cuban army fighting against the Spanish government with uh, Jose Marti and, uh, and helps uh, Cuba to fight for its independence. He's captured and killed by the Spanish government, however. Uh, so all sorts of crazy stories emerge from this. Hannah, thank you. Uh, Rhonda, thank you. Marilyn, thank you to the team at the Friends of the Sterling Road Library. I encourage everybody to join the Friends in these difficult times. Let's support our local libraries. They do more than books. They do this kind of programming. There's literacy classes. There's classes to help recent immigrants. There's computers. There's you name it. The libraries do it all. They're resource centers for our community. So I'm I'm honored and pleased to be a part of it. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thank Dr. You. Bye, everyone. Thanks for being here. Bye. And my niece, Willow, was on this call, prima ballerina. Just want to say thanks, Willow, for being on the call. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.